We're going to talk about relationships. So first, let's do what we all need to do in our relationships. Let's pray. <laughs> God, thank you so much for this time together as your church. Bless us now as we think about how to love one another, especially those people that we carry closest with us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. Amen. All right. Anyone remember MASH? I would play that game when I was a kid. Anyone remember MASH? Yeah, we got a few here. You would draw a box like that. You would draw a box, and it would have lines all around it, and you'd write the name of someone that you might marry, the places that you would live, how many kids you'd have, what job you'd get, what car you would drive. Then you'd have the letters MASH, which I think everyone was different, but our version, it stood for like mansion, apartment, shack, and house. <laughs> Uh, and then there was this elaborate system of elimination where you got rid of one item at a time from each category until you finally got down to the end of it uh, to see what your life would look like. And then to make it interesting, we'd always put a few duds in there, like, your car's a tricycle. Or, um, and the game was really silly in the beginning. It was those early years, but it was the beginning of us dreaming about the future, right? Of us thinking about what our future would look like, about what our spouse would be like. Uh, if you were a 90s kid, there were names like Will Smith or Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> uh, what kind of house we would live in, what job we would have. And then we get older, and I don't think most of us play MASH <laughs> anymore, but we still do dream about our future, about where we'd like to live, about what we'd like to do, and especially about who we'd like to share our lives with. So we don't have a box drawn on paper with little lines, but we still do have a huge box in our minds. We have a mental box, and in it we put our hopes and our dreams and our desires for this life. You've done this, right? You've thought about things like money, and you put money in the box, and you either put in the box, money is meant to be saved for a rainy day, or money is meant to be spent. And so you say, that's what money should look like in the future, and you put it in the box. Or you think, I'm going to buy a house in the suburbs, or get an apartment in the city, or I want to live off the grid out in the country somewhere, and you put it in the box. Or you think about, how many children do I want to have? I want a table full of kids, or I don't want any kids at all. They're gross and messy, and you put it in the box. <laughs> or you think about work, and you think either I want to live to work, or I just want to work to live and working for the weekend, and you put it in the box. And you think about conflict. You solve conflict by yelling until you're exhausted, or by ignoring each other, or by talking it out until 2 in the morning, and you put it in the box. And then you think about retirement, and you say, I want to retire early at 50 and enjoy my life, or they are going to have to take me out of my office feet first because I'm going to work till the day I die. And you put it in the box, and you take all of these hopes and dreams about your life, and you put them in this mental box. And then you're holding this box, and you turn around. And there's someone standing right in front of you that you want to date or marry or spend the rest of your life with or the next chapter of your life with them. And you run toward each other with sparkles of love and attraction in your eyes and they run up to you and you hand it to them. And you say, I have this box. Take it. The box with all your hopes and dreams and desires. And that is where things fall apart. That's where it falls apart. Because that box, to you, everything in that box is perfect. Why would you not want it to look like this? But to the person you've handed to, it doesn't feel like dreams and hopes. It feels like expectation. It feels like expectation. So maybe you dreamed about retiring at 50, but the person you've handed the box to, maybe they love to work, but now they feel like it's an expectation to retire at a certain time. You dreamed about a van just full of children, but you fell in love with someone and they don't know that they want kids. And now it's an expectation that they figure that out. To you, the box is full of dreams. To the person you handed it to, it's a box of expectations. There's a burden to that. And that's when we have conflict. Because that person that you're with, they have their own box. 
and they've handed that to you. And you're looking in and you're saying, there's a bunch of dreams and hopes in here, but they're not mine and they're doing the same thing. And now you have to decide what to do next. All right, so what does a happy couple do with that? We're going to look at Ephesians because the Bible has all the answers, I'm convinced. We're going to take Ephesians 5 and we're going to look at just two verses, two verses in Ephesians this morning. Let's take a look. Ephesians 5 verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. All right, so let's look closer. You ready? First part of the verse says, therefore, be imitators. Be imitators is what Paul writes. Now that's something we can do. We are natural imitators. From the time we're babies, we learn by imitating the people around us. It's how we learn to speak. It's how we learn to walk. It's how we learn to eat. Watch a baby. (laughs) You'll see him do this all the time. He tries to shape his mouth to make the noise and talk like the people around him are talking. He studies the way you lift your hand to your mouth and repeats it, you know, over and over. (laughs) He eventually gets it right, gets the food in. He repeats those motions, those things we were made to imitate. And that's true when it comes to our relationships, too. For better or for worse, the dreams and hopes that we have for our future and our relationships, that box that we're carrying around, we got from somewhere. Either because we saw something and we wanted it to, or we saw something and swore that would never be us, and so we're trying to avoid it. Maybe your parents, maybe you grew up and your parents had an amazing relationship, and you said, I want my relationship to look like that. Or maybe they fought all the time and so you swore, I will never be in a relationship like the one of my mom and dad. Maybe they fought all the time. Maybe you saw something on a movie or you talked to another couple, but no matter where you saw it, you watched and you learned and you made some decisions and you filled up a box of dreams and hopes and desires and expectations because we're imitators. So we imitate in our relationships. And Paul comes to us in Ephesians and says, yes, yes, keep doing that. You are made to imitate, but don't imitate just anyone. What's he say? Therefore, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. Now, you'd be right to think at this point, great, Megan, let's imitate God. How about we set the bar a little lower? We're talking about my relationships. Imitate God. I got out of bed this morning. Good job. Like, imitate God. Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you to do. Yes, I know you will fail at that. I will too. I do every day. I fail at that every day. But if we really want our relationships to be good, if we really want to be in happy couples, we got to imitate the best we got to imitate the the one who's perfect, the one who's all-knowing. If we want our relationships to be happy, why wouldn't we start with someone perfect and say, okay, God, what are like God's 10 tips to happy relationship? I'm in. I want to try that. So what would it look like to imitate God as we date or as we're engaged or as we're married or as we celebrate 10 or 20 or 50 years with someone? Look at the rest of the verse. Be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Live in love as Christ loved us. So what does it mean to love someone else and imitate God in doing that? It means to love them the way Christ loved you. Maybe some of you have heard the story, most of you have, of how Jesus Christ loved you. And so that idea makes you squirm. It should. (laughs) Or maybe you just did this to the person who came with you today. You're like, yeah, you should love me the way Christ loves you. (laughs) Because how did Jesus Christ love you? Jesus Christ loved you the way you needed to be loved. 
Jesus Christ loved you right where you are. Jesus Christ loved you not because of what he could get from you to get his needs met, but he chose to love you, even if you had nothing to offer. He loved you in what he taught, in the way he lived, and then ultimately gave his whole life for you because he loved you that much. He loved you that way. He loved you more than he loved himself. That's big time love. And then Paul turns to us in Ephesians and says, remember how Jesus loved you? Go love like that. That sounds really hard. (laughs) It is. It's really hard. In fact, sometimes it's impossible. But if you talk to happy couples, that's where they set the bar. A happy couple says, I am going to love you the way you need to be loved. A happy couple says, I love you right where you are. A happy couple says, I love you not for what I can get from you today, but because I'm going to choose to love you even if you have nothing to give back to me right now. And we're going to talk exactly about what that looks like next week. But first, we have to address that thing we're carrying around. Yeah, the box. There it is. It's back. That's that box with all that stuff you want out of your relationships. And we need to start there. So every week in this, in this series, we're going to ask you to do some homework at home. And some of you just got really excited because you think you get to go home and turn to the person that you're dating or married to or with and say, yeah, we got to talk about all those expectations you handed me. <laughs> That's not the homework this week. Sorry. The homework this week is for you. And I even left space in the bulletin under the scripture. I created paper space for you to do your homework. <laughs> so take your bulletin home. And I want you to go home and I want you to, to, to draw a box there. And I want you to think about what's in your mental box. What are the hopes and dreams you've handed to someone to make happen for you? What are those things that you're carrying around just waiting to hand to the first person who says that they're in, in a relationship? And then I want you to look at that list and think about your partner, whether it's the person you're with now or the person you're thinking you might be with in the future, and ask this question. What in my mental box is his? What in my mental box is hers? What is theirs to carry around? What in this box is their responsibility? All those things I want and I thought about when I was a kid and I hoped would be in my future. The kids, the house, the car, the job, the retirement plan, the trip, the financial portfolio, the way I spend my time, all those hopes and dreams. What does she have to take? What does he have to take? What does my partner have to carry that's in here? I think you already know the answer to that question. What does my partner have to carry? Nothing. Nothing. Your partner doesn't have to carry any of it. Paul did not say, live in love and look for someone who can make all your dreams come true. (laughs) Paul didn't say, live in love and you'll get everything you want. Paul didn't say live in love and find someone to carry around all the stuff you ever wanted. Don't ask them what they think about it. Just hand it to them. Wait for them to make it happen because if they really love you, they'll do that. No. (laughs) Paul said live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And happy couples know this. Happy couples know this. Happy couples know they don't have to carry anything for the other person. Happy couples know that the hopes and dreams of their partner are not expectations for them. But here's the secret. Happy couples carry all kinds of things for one another. Not because they have to. Not because they're expected to. Not because the other person handed it to them and said, here, this is yours now, make it happen for me. But they do it because they're happy to do it for the other person. So what does that mean and what does that look like? And what does the Bible tell us about how to do that? 
That's a good question. you got to come back next week because that's the work that Pastor Dave's going to do with us then. But we're going to do a few quick questions, and then we're going to get to the table together for communion. All right. All right, some great questions. Uh, okay. First, uh, let's see. Can occasional arguments be beneficial in relationships? I mean, I'd say sure. Like, <laughs> if you're not disagreeing, you're probably not paying attention because you're human and you're trying to share a life together, and that's really hard. And actually, in a couple weeks, we're going to talk about what it means to disagree. Yeah, and, and the, 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 the real benefit of arguments in relationships is the discovery you make about yourself. You know, you're, there's always that moment you're where you're welcome. like, <laughs> <laughs> where you're like, oh, this is about me. This isn't about you. And 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 that and and and, and relationships really do that for us. And that's they one do. way they refine us and help us become more like, uh, help us to imitate God. So in a couple of weeks, I think the message is titled "Sometimes You Throw Things." So if that was your question, two weeks, come on back. Yeah. Uh, so the greatest commandment uh, could be revised to love your neighbor, partner, as Jesus loved you comment. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, but if we're talking about greatest commandment, uh, sometimes we get too focused on our, our intimate relationships in church. We're like, you know, the, the, your family is, is your ministry. But no, I mean, you love everybody. Uh, when you, you say the greatest commandment, it's love others. Uh, but I think especially with the person you, you live with. But um, Yeah, start there and then branch it out. <laughs> yeah. I know a couple that doesn't agree on their hopes and dreams, so they've gotten stuck. What should mm -hmm. they do? Yeah, um, and we'll talk some more about this next week. Your hopes and dreams collide, and basically uh, one person can win, which means one person can lose. Uh, you can compromise, but let's be honest, compromise doesn't make anybody happy. Everybody kind of can lose sometimes when you do that. Um, and so there, there's a few approaches. Next week, though, we're going to look at the Bible's, like, secret option <laughs> of what do you do? What do you do when you have stuff in a box and I have stuff in a box and they collide together and it doesn't work? What do you do? Uh, so we're actually going to do more of that next week. That's right. And last, uh, no question, just a reminder, 26 wonderful years of experience. Always Good try job. to put the desires of your partner above your own in everything. Yeah. 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 And we'll talk about that more next week. Especially, yeah. I know we keep being like, next week, next week. But yeah, like, this is a four-week series. you got to invest in it with us. Um, it's not being a happy couple. There's a lot of stuff the world will tell you. And that stuff's there, but the Bible has a lot of really good teaching for us that's going to get us on the right path.